The Official Miser's Guide, Episode 1, One Chapter, Chapter 1, and Four Apologies. About a year ago, I had the chance to attend the New York premiere of the movie Kick-Ass, having been invited to that aforementioned screening by the awesome Hilary Rothing, a.k.a. Trisha Tanaka, who was at that point a television blogger for pop culture website UGO. I would gladly have paid American Greenbacks cash money to attend Kick-Ass. I see basically any comic book adaptation movie. But this premiere slash screening was even cooler because Kick-Ass co-creators Mark Miller and John Romita Jr. were in attendance and scheduled to do a Q&A session afterwards. Mark Miller is the writer who made Apollo Kiss the Midnighter, invented the Ultimates, got a teenage Aunt May pregnant in trouble, and whose online persona as a website columnist, in addition to being a professional writer, in many ways gave me the framework for the personality that I invented, and presumably all you guys love having shelled out American Greenbacks cash money for the official Miser's Guide, and use for my own public persona online. Despite being a gigantic Miller fan in general, I had not managed to read the graphic novel version of Kick-Ass at the point that my butt was in the screening seat, and so I didn't know that the film had one of those plot point discrepancies that regular folks never notice, but gets fanboy undies and purist panties all knotted up when some director makes Moira Taggart an American CIA agent or turns Glorfindel into Arwen Evenstar. Or whatever. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert, apparently... In the comic book, when Kick-Ass reveals to the girl of his dreams that he is not, in fact, her gay best friend, but madly gaga for her, and also a wannabe superhero, she has him beaten up. The more realistic situation, according to Miller during the Q&A. However, in the movie, she wraps her taut Hollywood body across him like a ravishing ribbon, and they make all kinds of awkward teenage monkey superhero love. Why, one of my fellow audience members asked, did Miller, who was intimately involved in all facets of the project, not just writing the original comic book, allow for the dramatically different change? Well, he said in his dead sexy Scottish accent, I figure if someone pays $12 to attend a movie, they want to see someone having sex. So... I realize, at this point, I owe you an apology. Forgive me. In fact, I probably owe you circa four apologies. Forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. To the best of my recollection, there is no one having sex in the official miser's guide. However... It does feature all kinds of other stuff, knowledge and good times and secret wisdom and love, all stacked on top of each other like Legos. And most importantly, my time. With that, I'd like to thank you for sharing your time with me over this project. You know, we talk about all different kinds of resources and magic. Land drops, life points, cards even the secondary market value of particular cards. But when it all comes down to it, there is really only one scarce resource in our lives. Time. So, I would really like to thank you for sharing your time, that most precious resource, with me today, and hopefully for the next six or seven weeks, as we assemble, page by mental page, the official Miser's Guide. So, what is the Official Miser's Guide? It's a fun, silly, but nevertheless descriptive name for a 30-plus day audio program that will help you refine your skills and understanding of competitive Magic the Gathering. We will focus on different areas, from improving your strategic understanding of how to approach a turn or win a matchup, to the specific mathematics that should be driving your mulligan decisions but might not be just yet. Let's pause a moment and perform your first exercise. You can do this easily if you are reading the ebook version of the Official Miser's Guide or if you are listening at your desk at work. 
but probably not if you're listening and driving. Please be safe. Look at your fingers in front of you and wiggle them. As you continue to put your focus on something separate and specific visually. So, if you're reading the official Miser's Guide, keep reading. As you are wiggling your fingers in front of you, like a piano playing or whatever. If you are looking at a computer screen at work, while listening and your fingers are on your keyboard already, you can start thrumming them as if you were typing. Slowly bring your hands, still wiggling your fingers, to the peripheries of your vision probably just to the right and left of your ears. You should still be reading, still have your conscious vision on your computer screen, or whatever you're looking at. Yet, be aware of some goofball wiggling fingers to your right and left. That's it. That's the exercise. If you want to stop now because you're in the middle of the office and you look like a clown, I can understand that. However, if you're on your own time and no one is standing there judging you right now, you can keep wiggling. I would love it if you continue with the exercise throughout your enjoyment of this episode. Another strategy that will accomplish the exact same thing is to extend your awareness to something like the legs of your glasses. I wear glasses. While you continue to do what you were looking at already, what you just did is consciously engage your peripheral vision. We'll get more to why this is useful tomorrow, but for now, back to opening day proper. You know, I have worked with the absolute best players of all time as a playtest partner and deck designer over the past 15 years. I actually got to play in my first Pro Tour in 1996, if you can believe that. I've not only driven Pro Tour and Grand Prix Top 8s with unique strategies, but national and world championship wins. But more than that, just being around the best players ever, I've been able to pick up the kinds of things the average aspiring grinder has not yet been exposed to. Stuff that is blatantly obvious to some Pro Tour champions probably never occurs to the aspiring PTQ player, who is today just focused on increasing their likelihood of making Top 8. We're going to go over specific things to look out for and identify in your own game that you might want to change and things that your opponents might be doing that aren't 100% of the up and up. And each and every day, we are going to give you a homework assignment. Yes, a homework assignment. Why? Right now, some of you are scratching your heads and saying, I know from the blue-green Genesis wave deck that Michael Flores is some kind of evil lunatic, but I paid dozens and dozens of hard-earned American dollars on this. He's going to give me homework like my second-grade teacher? Yes. Yes, I am. Because a lot of what we're going to work on might seem out there to you, certainly different from how you approach magic, and to a different degree, life and homework will help you reinforce the changes that you learn during each day's audio episode. Homework doesn't necessarily have to be hard. It might only take 20 minutes, and often a 20 minutes while you're watching television, playing Mario Kart Wii, or going for a jog around the neighborhood. Trust me. Magic is fun to me. That's why I've stuck with it with the passion that I have for the past 17 years. Homework will be productive, but also fun. Promise. So, the other thing that might be running through your head. Audio. Why audio? Today, Luis Scott Vargas, Conley Woods, and Michael Jacob make liberal use of Magic Online as a tool to teach their readers constructed player deck design. But a lot of you probably remember that I was actually the first writer to mainstream the use of Magic Online screen capture software and integrate constructed replay videos with articles or as metagame teaching tools. In an age where YouTube is one of the most popular entertainment websites on the internet, isn't a move from video just to audio like a step backwards? It turns out that the answer is not even close. It probably won't surprise you to hear that I am a magic podcast junkie. As far as I know, Top 8 Magic, the podcast that Brian David Marshall and I have been doing for more than six years, was the first, and still the best, magic podcast. 
I also listen to other podcasts like Canada's The A-Team Podcast or Yo! MTG Taps with Joey Pasco and Big Head Joe at StarCityGames.com. I found myself listening to these podcasts at work. My background is very details-intensive, writing very technical advertisements or working on auction bidding and game theory with lots of spreadsheet work. So my eyes and mind would generally be engaged, but I could have my ears open. Podcasts, that is, audio content, I found to be perfect for work. Because I'm a magic podcast junkie, I found myself trying to shoehorn other types of magic media into the same experience. I would go to Daily MTG and download old Pro Tour Top 8s and check out Nassif's Called Shot, or the $16,000 Lightning Helix, or the incomparable Brian Hacker color commentating on Maher v. Davis. But you know what? You can't just listen to Gabrielle and Nassif top decking into the cruel ultimatum called shot. In order to get the full effect, you have to watch Nassif organize his mana and joke about what he's doing beforehand. So, at least for the way I was enjoying magic content, I found video to be worse than audio content. I don't know if you notice the difference between how I do voiceovers for my magic gameplay videos versus how other writers do it. But my background comes from the years I spent in the booth with Randy Bueller. I try to recap the main action of what is occurring on the battlefield rather than assuming that my viewer is paying close attention to every detail. I guess that would make it easier for me to not watch one of my own videos as a listener. So when something exciting is happening in one of my colleagues' videos or Pro Tour Top 8 coverage or GG's Live, I would have to jump between windows taking me out of what I was doing in terms of answering emails, working on spreadsheets, writing copy, or writing ads. I guess it's possible that I do voiceovers for people like me. Okay, we've got the what and the where down. What about the who, why, and how? The who isn't just me telling you my opinion on things, for whatever reason you would listen. It's me and you and lots of the greatest names in the game and further on in the program, actual guest stars. A lot of readers comment on my frequent name-dropping in articles without really understanding why I've always done it. I mean, who's the beatdown? Generally considered to be the greatest magic article of all time. Was driven by my railbirding a particular match played by my best friend as he failed to make top 8 of a particular PTQ. Name-dropping might actually answer a big question you have before you even ask it. How come I'm doing this program? I haven't won any pro tours or anything, but I have been around writing at the top of the magic media field for more than 15 years. The best, or at least many of the most famous and or successful players in the world have come to me as a go-to resource. Even if I didn't have magic expertise myself, Anyone who's been rail-burning the best for as long as I have, anyone with any kind of a functional IQ, that is, can't avoid having picked up something useful. This is the basis for strategies that you can take, carry forward, and replicate to improve your game, your overall experience, and your enjoyment of the process at the same time. Case in point, a few years ago, I was qualified for Pro Tour Charleston. Incidentally, this was around the same time that John Finkel made his comeback Pro Tour appearance. Most people don't know this, but John and I were collaborating on a book that has yet to see the light of publication. I would go over to John's apartment with a podcast recorder and try to lead the most naturally talented and genius player of all time into comprehensible paragraphs and sound bites that we could eventually edit into something publishable. I was not successful, initially. Then John had a radical idea, which was just to play magic. His theory was that stuff would come out in the games that we could translate into general rules of good gameplay. Initially, I thought he could play magic online and I could bird everything he did with a spiral notebook in my hands, but he wasn't interested in that at all. Instead, like I said, I was qualified for the Team Pro Tour. He had me bring playtest decks, and we started that way. 
practical insofar as my preparation for Charleston. Something amazing happened, which is that the fire got lit under John's seat, and he decided to start preparing for Charleston himself. He brought back his old Antarctic teammates, the OMS brothers, and used his Hall of Fame qualification to get them all invited. Our one-on-one -on -one gaming sessions grew, and all of a sudden, John's palatial Soho apartment became a hub of gaming, the early stages of what would become the New York Finkel Draft scene that has produced comeback stories like John and Kuala Lumpur, Jamie Park as the finalist of the World Championships, Tom Martell's emergence as a notable player at all, and countless PTQ victories. With John's Charleston teammate Steve OMS, now even in the Hall of Fame himself. What does this have to do with anything? While I was trying to bird John professionally, Tony Sai, the shark, was birding him personally. Here, Tony said as he handed me a box of sunflower seeds one day, I saw John eating these. So I went and bought some. They're probably what makes him smart. The scales lifted off my eyes. I had come to Jesus via a most surprising path. From that day on, we just copied whatever John was eating that seemed out of the ordinary. Sunflower seeds were just the start. At the time, John was big into Red Bull, especially when working. John then worked from home office. He would make stunning feats of execution while the rest of us were at the card tables. So we started chugging Red Bulls, too. More than that, I expanded into red vitamin water because, hey, it was supposedly full of taurine, supposedly the active brain enhancer in Red Bull, as well. By the Pro Tour, our snacks were all sunflower seeds based, and I drank more Red Bull that weekend than almost any weekend before or since. Any weekend but one, anyway. Now, history will tell you that John's big comeback win on the Pro Tour would not come until Kuala Lumpur and Lorwyn Block. But for my part, copying all kinds of stuff that may or may not have made any difference at all resulted in a personal record at the Team Pro Tour that would have been comfortably good enough for an individual top eight. I played better magic that weekend than I ever did at any other Pro Tour and got compliments from the friends who are usually the ones dressing me down. Now I said that there was maybe one other weekend that I filled myself with as much taurine as Charleston, and that was a bit later, at the New York State Championships, which was my next big tournament after the Pro Tour. I drank like three sugar-free Red Bulls and five red vitamin waters, at least, over the course of the day, and easily cruised to my win with Brian Cowell's This Girl Angel Deck. Just one week later... I was talking to my friend D.C. Dave, who was up for the New Jersey Grand Prix from, you know, Washington, D.C., and he asked me about my taurine supplementation during tournaments. Because Magic players are a varied, colorful, talented, and quite interesting a lot, D.C. Dave works for DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is a not-so-secret division of the United States Defense Department, responsible for basically everything, that could conceivably fall between the endposts of the internet and figuring out how to get monkeys to fly jet fighters. By the way, that was a project DC Dave was working on at the time. Anyway, the reason he was so interested in taurine supplementation, and the fact that I seemed to do better at decision making and in long tournaments while using taurine, was that DARPA, they had a book on how to make Iron Man. It is essentially every piece of technology the Defense Department has on how to enhance a human in one book that DC Dave wouldn't let me read. Taurine was in that book. We don't know exactly what it does, said DC Dave, but we know that it does something. Well, apparently... One of the things it does is help you perform a bit better in magic tournaments, possibly even in small doses, considering how much of it is in a bottle of vitamin water. It probably won't surprise you then to learn that all the way into 2011, while in the midst of writing the official Miser's Guide, 
I won a TCGplayer.com 5K using many of the principles and techniques described herein, including, in this case, non-stop Red Bull and taurine vitamin water. Plus, today, I actually just take taurine supplements. I included this because it's just a funny story that intersects somewhat with what I am talking about here, the who. Snacks and Red Bulls aside, there are some very real, often strongly mathematically provable techniques that we can learn from the best players of the past 15 years and more that we can integrate into our own games. Okay, that leaves us with the why and the how. The why is easy. I love magic, and presumably you do too. We can share something together that makes everyone happy and makes everyone better. I think there are fun things that you will learn and learn to do while you're participating in the Official Miser's Guide program that will not just make you a better gamer, but better at life. Really? Okay, here goes the how. Have you ever heard the terms legalese or legal loophole talking about lawyers or how they get obviously guilty defendants out of trouble? I think the ire that some people have talking about lawyers comes from the fact that they think so differently from everyday citizens. For example, a lawyer might make the argument that his client didn't commit a particular act, but even if she did that act wouldn't rise to the criteria of the crime she's accused of. It's like a roller coaster of savage S-turns is whirling about in the lawyer's imagination, and the judge and opposing counsel have to have similar carousels, or at least hot dog stands between their ears too, to accept, consider, or combat that kind of argument. She didn't do it, but even if she did, it doesn't constitute a crime, or at least that crime. Indeed. A lawyer in this spot has to actually imagine multiple, potentially conflicting universes just to write a sentence in a brief? Me, I have no beef with the obviously different way that lawyers have been taught to think. In fact, I was in my first year of law school when I wrote Who's the Beatdown? And I think that, combined with the fact that I had a good eight years of Socratic technique-driven Jesuit education before college, informs how I approach magic and how I am going to present this material. Before we go any further, I want to make something clear. I don't particularly care what you think. I don't mean to be a jerk. I mean, that it's very hard to actually change someone's mind about something that they have decided they believe. And when successful persuasion does occur, it's usually because the persuadee is convinced that they came up with the idea all by themselves. Instead, I am much more interested in how you think, specifically how you formulate arguments and how you think about and approach magic. Instead of trying to convince you to think exactly the way I do, I don't know that you would want to for one thing, the material in this project is going to be more about giving you the tools to produce your own great ideas but with a much better measuring stick for evaluation than you had yesterday. Some of you probably already know this, but when I presented my blue-green Genesis wave deck on TCGplayer.com, the response was overwhelmingly negative. I mean, like a tidal wave of, This is a bad deck! And, you're a bad person, type comments. It was so ludicrous that Patrick Chapin posited that there must be one forum troll with 75 separate accounts posting because no group of people could possibly be so bad and hostile and wrong all at the same time. The thing that was really shocking at the time was that the blue-green Genesis wave deck while not perfect at that point, and not perfect even come the World Championships, was simply the most powerful strategy conceived of in standard at the time, with numerous almost unlosable matchups. It wasn't so much a matter of opinion as readers being unable to differentiate not between optimal and suboptimal, or between degrees of viability, but between very good and very bad. 
Now, it obviously couldn't have been very bad, as right after the World Championships, Conley Woods and one of his buddies two for two the top eight of an open event with a modified version of the blue-green deck. It might have had a soft Boros matchup or so, but very bad? Could not remotely describe this deck. As you build upon your own knowledge and experience in Magic, and I'm sure you have a working amount already, or you probably wouldn't be listening to this, you will be able to operate closer to the beginning of that last sentence, rather than the train wreck at the end of it. If you ever wonder how I've been able to stay relevant and popular for the past 15 years without a Pro Tour win or any of the trappings that mark the top echelon of my magic writing colleagues, the answer is there. I am concerned with the development of new technology and in developing how my readers think, improving and enriching their experiences, challenging what they think already, and giving them, giving you things that you love, that you can walk away from an article with, not just a format-breaking deck. But while we're on the subject of format-breaking decks, it's probably no secret that I think about things a little bit differently from most players. And it really shouldn't be a secret considering the topic of the last 10 or 12 paragraphs. Over the course of the Official Miser's Guide, I will share with you some of those different ways that I evaluate card choices and imagine or visualize end games, the processes by which some of these successful napsters and lightsabers and gnarled masses find their ways onto excess napkins, let alone in front of players at the final tables of Pro Tours. And a final word on format. Earlier, I mentioned that we are going to do homework every day. Homework is especially important today because at this point we're 3,000 plus words into the first episode and I almost feel like I haven't given you anything besides some new student orientation BS or diploma polishing about myself that you probably didn't need to hear. Now the bet is that we can build on your skills, reinforce what you're good at, and give you tools to supplement what you haven't mastered yet. Imagine for the sake of argument that on day zero, you're only 25% as good as you can be. And any given unit in the official miser's guide is only useful to the tune of 1%. Provided we can teach you anything at all and give you tools and homework that can help make those tools real to you, what does that look like at the end of 30 days? I think you'll be surprised. Amazingly. In just 30 days, with a mere 1% improvement over what you had the day before, you will go from 25% to almost 34% of your potential. But relative to your own level, you will have grown by nearly 35%. No, of course, these numbers are imaginary. But go with me for a second. What if there is some real game changer that alters the way you approach some aspect of magic in a new and positive way for all time? My guess is that for some players, that will be, oh, around day 22, when we get into the mathematics of opening hand evaluation. What if you get some kind of gigantic 5% improvement just on that day? What does that look like? So, if you have a one-time 5% lift three-quarters into the official miser's guide amidst a month of otherwise mediocre lessons, your personal capacity for magic can jump 40% in a month? Holy imaginary numbers, Batman! The thing is, I think that for most players, there will be more than one day like that. Before you bought this audio program, you probably read the hype copy and shook your head, asking if it could possibly be true. Yes, this project is equivalent to over a year of top magic strategy articles by yours truly. More than one of them will be as moving as who's the beat down to more than one listener slash reader slash beloved customer. I thank you again for your time and your faith. And for today, I bring you 20 more minutes. So what we are going to conclude with today is our first homework assignment. I want you to smile. Put on a goofy grin. I mean a big, whopping, toothsome grin. If you stare into the mirror doing it, great. I mean, you don't have to. You can do it at your desk if you are listening to this at work, or you can keep smiling it forward after the opening day audio stops 
if you're listening in your car or on your commute, I just want you to smile for 20 minutes. I know, I know, it sounds stupid. And anyway, who smiles for 20 straight minutes? The answer is that you do, for today at least. I'm not going to tell you why yet, but it's going to be awesome. And it's going to be worth your 1% today. There's an additional track with about 20 minutes of royalty-free stuff that came with my iMac that you can listen to after this recording to keep time with your smile, if you so choose. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow with an introduction to technology. Plus, you'll find out why you were wiggling your fingers next to your ears like playing peekaboo with a two-year-old. Love, Mike.